Great, we'll get started. Welcome, we are honored to have you joining us and sharing your time for today's webinar, Boarding Schools Healing Lessons for Tomorrow. This hour long webinar will explore the impacts of American Indian residential schools on the emotional, physical, and spiritual well being of American Indian and Alaska Native children and their families. Key components of Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policy Act will be explored, as well as culturally based approaches to trauma-informed care to promote healing and resiliency for youth, adults, families, and communities. My name is Liz Best, and I'm a manager of technical assistance with the Technical Assistance Research Center here at NICUI. We kindly ask that you place your name, your organization, your tribal affiliation, and title into the chat box. In addition, we welcome any feedback you would like to provide about your webinar experience with us today in a survey, which will also be posted in the chat box. Next slide, please. Before we get started, Ebi Maho with Nakui will offer an opening prayer to start today's session to get us all in a good place. Thank you, Ebi. Thank you. I think you have a good day. Um Hade she um Behaz Ani Hadil Yago Kaya Bakago Ultra Ulyani Nil Ako Naha Alchin Nihi Awe needs O Kenny Nalake at that A needs A at the Haskia Ade Ye who did any Bizad Bein Utsutazinada Nako Hutalia Ako Akushi Nahe to Andakre Nata has Kayan Dishli de Ye de Bibe Bandast in Oko de in the Nanoklini Naha Bikit no e do Betraya and that in the adult left in Sekistian Do ranje I'll translate this in English. Um, holy ones, many of our relatives have endured hardship due to foreign policies ideologies and practices which haven't disrupted our native traditional ways our foreign systems which have created boarding schools that have impacted many of our children for those who've been impacted we ask the holy ones that you be with them to guide them out of pain and sadness and back into harmony and balance through our prayer that you guide, protect, and be with us as we partake in our discussions and work. Empower us to conduct our work with compassion, humility, openness, and patience. We offer thanks for allowing us to work with our UIO leaders and staff, the people from various clans, bands, tribes, and nations. With this, all will be restored. All has to return into its balance and beauty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Evie. Next slide, please. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. For those of you that are not that are unfamiliar with NICUI, here's a little background. The National Council of Urban Indian Health, also known as NICUI, is a national nonprofit devoted to support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health care for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. NICUI is the only national representative of the 41 Title V Urban Indian Organizations or UIOs 
under the Indian Health Service and the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. NICUI strives to improve the health of over 70% of the American Indian Alaska Native population that lives in urban areas, supported by quality, accessible health care services. Next slide, please. And just quickly, today's webinar is made possible by the Indian Health Services Cooperative Agreement Funds. This event is solely the responsibility of the National Council of Urban Indian Health and does not necessarily represent the views of Indian Health Services or the Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide, please. Please note that when you arrived in the room today that this session is being recorded for educational and quality improvement purposes. Next slide, please. Also note that all mics have been muted upon entry. We always encourage participation and engagement, and we invite all the participants to turn on their cameras and post questions and comments in the chat box. There will also be opportunities to participate in the Q&A at the end of this session. Next slide, please. So for those of you uh, unfamiliar with how to access the chat box, this slide features some information on how to use Zoom and access the chat box. At the bottom of your screen, you can find the chat feature. Click on that to enter the chat and please enter your questions and comments there. Next slide, please. We understand that today's webinar, while promoting healing, explores a difficult topic for so many. And due to the sensitive nature of the webinar, we are offering an emotional support wellness room. If you need support at any time, you may request to go into that room. At the bottom of your screen, you can find the chat box feature, press on the downward arrow and pick on uh, Nikui's social emotional. Um, it's Antoinette, but Molly will let you into the room. Um, and that's Molly Siegel. You can just send her a message and she will put you into a chat room. Next slide, please. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce our presenters today. For today's webinar, we are both thrilled to bring together Alexander Pan and Jeremy Gravinet from Nikui and Mr. Rebriera from Generation Red Road. Alexandra joined the National Council of Urban Indian Health in October of 2021 where she currently works as a federal relations manager. Her duties include drafting comments to federal agencies, tracking, analyzing, and reporting relevant regulations, policies, and agency actions that impact UIOs, and advocating for ways to improve healthcare and public health programs and services to urban American Indians and Alaska Natives. Jeremy is the Congressional Relations Policy Manager here at NACUI, and his primary role is working with members of Congress to ensure that urban Indian organizations have the resources that they need to serve their communities. We are also beyond honored to have Mr. Rivera from Generation Red Road sharing with us today as well. Mr. Rivera is the Chief Cultural Officer at American Indian Health and Services located in Santa Barbara, California and founder of Generation Red Road located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Mr. Rivera is an enrolled tribal member of the Sherwood Valley Band of Pullman Indians and is also of Mexican descent. He continues to make a difference in Native Indigenous tribal communities, serving as leadership to both companies and is also passionate about developing new curriculum to better meet the needs of tribal and urban Native American communities. Mr. Rivera has also been an active committee member for the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency State Committee for California, appointed by Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, and with that, um, Alexandra, we'll start. Next slide, please. Thank you, Liz. Uh, good it's afternoon. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, thank you, Liz. Good afternoon, everyone. It is truly an honor to be able to be here with you to uh, both to be able to share uh, some of the work that is happening in Congress relating to reporting school policies, uh, but also to learn uh, from my fellow speakers and those that are on this call. Uh, and we're going to be looking, I'm going to be sharing a bit about the work in Congress and uh, the work that is happening so that Native people and their communities uh, can begin the healing process that is needed. Now, while we still don't know a lot of the details, I wanted to give a brief history of the boarding school policies, how they've made, impacted Native communities, in case there's anyone on this call that is not familiar with this history, uh, especially with just the horrific history that the federal government uh, and their treatment of Native children through these policies. As you can see on the slide, I have a short timeline of the policies that led to the proliferation of boarding schools in the United States and their consequences. 
Now, the foundation of these policies began with the Civilization Fund Act of 1819. This is where the the United States government and Congress appropriated money and paid for Christian missionaries to set up schools in Indian territories to help the government eliminate native military resistance and to teach native children to replace their traditional practices with Christian practices. This legislation is what set the stage for a boarding school system that would soon be in place in the late 1800s. Now the peace policy, uh, which was President Grant's peace policy of 1869, this started Native American children being taken from their homes and sent to Christian and government-run boarding schools. Now, the purpose was to, quote-unquote, civilize uh, the Native children and to stamp out Native culture. It was a deliberate policy of ethnocide and cultural genocide. In 1879, that is when the first federal boarding school was opened. This was the Carlisle Indian School, which was explicitly founded on the principle that Native Americans must be taught to reject tribal culture and to adapt to white society. In 1891, Congress commissioned, uh, authorized the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to make sure that attendance was being enforced and providing funding for the transportation of children from their reservation homes and communities to boarding schools. By 1926, nearly 83% of Native school-aged children were enrolled in Indian boarding schools. Now, in 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson called for a shift in federal Indian policy, going away from the termination area of tribe, termination of tribes and Native culture towards supporting Native self-determination and affairs. He directed the Secretary of Interior to establish Indian, boarding, uh, Indian school boards uh, for federal Indian schools to be com com comprised, apologies, comprised by members of their communities. In 1969, a special Senate committee on Indian education issued a report stating uh, that the Indian education policy that had existed was a national tragedy. Now, there were several major legislations uh, during the 70, 1970s aimed at improving edu Indian education. Uh, in 1972, Congress passed the Indian Education Act, which established a comprehensive approach to meeting the unique needs of American Indian and Alaska Native students. This act recognized that these students have unique educational and cultural related academic needs and distinct language and cultural needs. Now, the by far most far reaching legislation to be signed in the 70s was the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act of 1975. And this guaranteed that tri tribes would have the opportunity to determine their own futures and education of their children through funds allocated and administered by individual tribes. Now, as I mentioned, the consequences uh, of these boarding schools were horrific, and there's still much that is to be learned and, and discovered. Native children that were forcibly um, and voluntarily removed from their homes and families and communities during this time were taken to schools far away uh, where they were punished for speaking their native language, banned from acting in any way that might seem to represent traditional or cultural practices, stripped of traditional clothing, hair, personal belongings, and behaviors reflective of their native culture. Uh, the schools were often overcrowded for uh, nourishment and harsh punishment uh, for failure to uh, abide by the strict rules. Uh, children suffered physical, sexual, cultural, and spiritual abuse and neglect and experienced treatment that in many cases constituted torture for speaking their native language. And then on the unfortunate circumstances where children passed away, they would be buried in unmarked graves. Now, the federal government ended its policies, you know, over 50 years ago, but it still has not appropriately reckoned with the modern consequences uh, for its actions, which brings us to the work that is happening today to enlighten policymakers and the public uh, about this issue. Last Congress, the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding Schools Act, uh, Indian Boarding Schools Act Policies Act, was introduced. Uh, this bill was bipartisan. It was introduced in the House by Representative Sharice Davis, who is one of the first Native women to be elected to Congress and the chair of the Native American Caucus. And in the Senate, it was introduced by Elizabeth Warren. The House bill had 87 co-sponsors and the Senate bill had 26, which shows that there was significant support in Congress to finally address uh, these issues. Now, this bill would create a commission that was tasked with investigating and documenting Indian boarding school policies 
and understanding the resulting historical and ongoing trauma. The commission would provide an environment for Native people to speak about their personal experiences and provide recommendations to the government on how to address the harm that it caused. It also, the commission would also work in collaboration with other agencies to develop recommendations to the federal government on how to acknowledge this trauma and help Native communities heal. At the same time that this legislation was introduced, a couple months before, the Federal Boarding School Initiative was uh, introduced at the Department of Interior. And Alexandra is going to talk a little bit more about this, uh, but I wanted to just highlight this quote by Secretary Deb Holland because I really think it highlights the importance of addressing historical harms, even if those policies are no longer in place. And she says, I know that this process will be long and difficult. I know that this process will be painful. It won't undo the heartbreak and loss we feel. But only by acknowledging the past can we work toward a future that we're all proud to embrace. And I think you know, that's the goal of those that are pushing for the legislation for Policies Act, goal of this presentation, um, and, and the work uh, that Mr. Rivera is doing as well is addressing the healing so that we can be proud of a future that we can all embrace. Now, unfortunately, despite significant congressional and, of course, Indian country support for this legislation, it did not pass in last Congress. And one of the main stumbling blocks around this legislation passing was the issue of giving the commission subpoena power. Now, there was a hearing held last year, um, and in that hearing, Representative Obermulty, who at the time was the Republican ranking member of the committee, the subcommittee that was holding this hearing, said that this granting the commission subpoena power was adversarial to the goal of healing. And if that was included in the legislation, it would not pass out of committee. And if for those that might not be familiar with the process of uh, you know, a bill becoming a law, uh, it has to typically pass out of a committee before it will be taken up by you know, the House as a whole to vote on. And so for some context, you know, subpoena power is very rare on congressional commissions. Um, in fact, only 12 out of 160 since 1989 have uh, possessed subpoena power. But uh, authors of this legislation felt that it was important to ensure that the necessary evidence would come to light during this process. And having the subpoena power would ensure that no, no perpetrators or um, other individual that might contain evidence would withhold that from, from Congress um, for a variety of reasons. Now, unfortunately, we are now in a new congressional session. Um, a new Congress came in. Yeah, this is the right slide. Thank you. Uh, a new Congress came in, which means we have to start the advocacy over again. Uh, Nakui is working with members of Congress and Native partners uh, to ensure that this bill is introduced, uh, reintroduced, as well as pass this Congress. Uh, this is a, a major priority for uh, our policy and congressional department. Uh, and so we're actively working on that. I also thought that people on this call might want to think about how they can help. And at this moment, really one of the best ways is to simply contact your representative to let them know that you support this legislation and you want them to support it and ensure that it's passed. It might seem very simple, but as we've done a lot of congressional advocacy, very often we talk to offices and they say, oh, we heard, you know, people are writing into our office, we're on board with this. And so offices are usually very receptive to the input that they receive from their constituents. If you're not sure who your representative is, you can just go to house.gov um, and then right, I kind of screenshotted there, but right on the top of the website, it says, find your representative. You put in your zip code and you'll get your representative. You can then click to their website from that page and on their website, they will have a contact page. You can fill out, it's usually just a, a form. You put your name, what you're asking for. You would wanna say, you know, co-sponsor the Truth and Healing Commission and Indian Boarding Schools Act. Uh, you could put your personal experience or story, uh, and that will be your advocacy as we are working through this through this process. I will now turn it over to my colleague and brilliant federal relations manager, Alexandra, to talk about the aspects that they're doing on the federal side relating to these boarding school policies. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, boarding schools are a tragic thread in the history of the United States which authorized the forced removal of hundreds of thousands of native children as young as five years old, relocating them from their homes. And in response to this on June 22nd, 2021, Department of Interior Secretary 
Holland issued a memorandum directing the Department of Interior to prepare a report addressing the intergenerational trauma, cycles of violence and abuse, disappearance, premature deaths, and other undocumented bodily and mental impacts. This initiative came weeks after, after the discovery of 215 Indigenous children's remains were found in boarding schools in Canada. And Secretary Holland noted that to promote spiritual and emotional healing in American Indian and Alaska Native communities, we, the DOI, must shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past, no matter how, how hard it will be. After she uh, made this note, uh, Nakui issued a statement commending Secretary Holland for beginning the process of holding the United States accountable for the effects of its boarding school policies. Um, and Nakui also subsequently issued um, uh, comments to the Department of Interior and the administration um, after the introduction of this uh, memorandum and this initiative. And on May in May 2022, Volume 1 of the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative Investigative Report was published. This investigation found that from 1819 to 1969, the Federal Indian Boarding School System consisted of 408 federal schools across 37 states and then territories, including 21 schools in Alaska and seven schools in Hawaii. The department's investigation has already identified or marked or unmarked burial sites at approximately 53 different schools across the Federal Indian Boarding School System. And they've also identified approximately 19 Federal Indian Boarding Schools accounting for over 500 American Indian and Alaska Native um, and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian children's deaths. Sadly, as this investigation continues, like I mentioned, this is just volume one, the department expects the number of, identif of identified burial sites and the record number of deaths of Native children from these boarding schools to increase. Next slide. As I briefly mentioned, Nakui um, submitted comments um, after the introduction of this initiative. And we have continued to voice our ongoing support for the administration's efforts to address the legacy of boarding school programs. And we commend Secretary Holland's leadership on this initiative. In December of 2021, Nakui submitted written comments to the Department of Interior regarding the agency's initiative. In our comments, we ultimately urge the department and the administration to address the ongoing effects of Indian boarding schools on the American Indian and, Amer and Alaska Native health, and to also partner with American Indian and Alaska Native organizations, including UIOs, to fully study and understand the impact of boarding school trauma and to, to assist survivors and their relatives in the healing process. Next slide. In our comments, we specifically requested that DOI incorporate the following items into this initiative. We requested that the DOI and the administration partner with American Indian and Alaska Native organizations, including UIOs, to understand the impact of this trauma. We also requested that they study the lasting impact of boarding school policies, including intergenerational trauma, of the social determinants of health in contemporary American Indian and Native Alaska Native communities today. We also recommended that they include UIOs in the process throughout and establish or introduce an urban confer policy to really um, hear the voices of urban Natives today. We also recommended that they ensure a comprehensive assimilation of data by making all American Indian and Alaska Native communities true partners in the initiative. Our comments also stressed um, the importance of recognizing tribal sovereignty and the government to government relationship, as this is vital to the initiative. But we also noted failure to include UIOs in consultation and confer will leave a significant portion of the American Indian and Alaska Native population out. Thank you. Um, this slide uh, shows a map uh, that was produced as part of the initiative. Um, on the map, you see several blue dots, and these blue dots indicate locations where they have identified um, federal Indian boarding schools. Um, this map doesn't include, uh, or this slide doesn't include maps of Alaska and Hawaii. So I just want to note that because there were boarding schools there, so there as well. Um, but part of the reason why Nakui exists today is because of the historic oppressions of the American Indian and Alaska Native populations 
and the assimilation policies, including federal Indian boarding schools that resulted in thousands of American Indians and Alaska Natives being uh, relocated to uh, urban areas, metropolitan areas, and cities today. Um, like I said, UIOs are located in urban areas where federal Indian boarding schools once existed. And as part of this initiative, um, the DOI has con conducted extensive research and identified hundreds of locations, um, some of which are located in cities where there are UIOs or in UIO service areas. So on the slide on the right hand side, I listed a few examples of where there were once federal Indian boarding schools and locations where there are now UIOs today. Um, this is definitely not an exhaustive list, um, but I just wanted to note that um, Arizona, specifically in the Phoenix area, um, there are UIOs today, as well as in Kansas, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, in Colorado, in the Denver metro area, and um, several boarding schools throughout California, including the San Diego area, where the San Diego American Indian Health Center was once, or uh, where the St. Anthony Industrial School of Indians, which was boarding school, is located, where now today the San Diego American, San Diego American Indian Health Center is. Next slide. Um, just a note with that last slide, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, um, I'll post uh, the link to uh, the maps that were created in the chat after this. Um, so while Mr. Rivera will dive into the aspects of intergenerational trauma and ways to heal, I just wanted to highlight the services that UIS provide to address trauma that boarding school survivors may face and the intergenerational trauma that may stem from our, nation, our nation's dark history of implementing these schools and their policies. Um, UIOs are essential in providing American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas with the care and resources they need, not only to address physical health, but to also provide patients with culturally competent behavioral, social, and cultural services um, that are listed on this slide. UIOs have also noted that these services are critical in assisting their patients who may be experiencing trauma and intergenerational trauma in some cases related to federal Indian boarding school policies. So on this slide, you can see um, UIOs are able to offer these um, services to their patients um, that have proven to be an incredible benefit to their patients. And with that, I will hand this off to Mr. Rivera, who will provide a thorough presentation on cultural healing and provide some more background on intergenerational trauma. Thank you. Take it away, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Alexandra. <clears throat> Uh, you see, good afternoon, relatives. Good morning, um, wherever you are at in the Turtle Island. Um, my name is Carlos Rivera. I am the Chief Cultural Officer um, at the American Indian Health and Services located in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, I'm also um, the founder of a national nonprofit called Generation Red Road, which um, was started um, out of uh, prayer. It was uh, it was founded. Um, to provide another option to our tribal communities um, across the country um, to, to access healing. Um, you know, when I took a look at the national work that I've done, um, you know, whether it's uh, in Canada or even California, there's not many options out there. Um, I think there's a lot of regional, um, you know, programs that, that are doing this work. But on a national level, there wasn't many. And so I wanted to provide another option. Um, and uh, provided some approaches to healing, which is what I want to share with you all today. Um, you know, this is the work that we're doing currently in Santa Barbara, California, and uh, in other urban and tribal communities across the country. Um, I'm a person in healing. Um, I always say healing because it's much more than, than um, you know, addiction. It's much more than, than uh, sobriety. It really is healing from the historical, the intergenerational trauma that was passed down to me, um, and also the traumas that I experienced in my life. Um, and so it, it really, it, it really is, includes all of it, um, you know, not just one or the other. Um, so if you can turn the slide, please. Next slide. So I want to share with you some, uh, again, some approaches that we're using at this moment, um, you know, as we talk about healing from trauma, healing from uh, addiction. 
um, you know, there's a there's an understanding. And so what I'm sharing with you is, you know, uh, the work that I've done um, with several different communities over the years, um, you know, had an opportunity to to learn from elders, to learn from mentors and uh, and also to go within and seek out the answers for my ancestors that that have passed down the healing to me as well. And so we had this understanding that there was uh, uh, an original source of creation and in our many languages, um, you know, we have a way in which we address creator. Um, in my Pomo language, uh, we, uh, we refer to creator as uh, Yake Akapade. Um, in my Sundance circle, um, we call creator Tunkashila. Um, and, you know, but you think about the many languages this morning in our prayer, you know, we heard beautiful language. Um, and so there's many, many names for, for this original source, God, uh, Jesus, uh, Maono, many names. Allah is also, you know, how we refer to creator. But our ancestors, um, you know, had that understanding that there was this original source that created everything. And so if you can forward the slides as I'm talking here, um, that there was this understanding that uh, we all came from this original source, not just the human being, but also the animals, the plants, the trees, until the circle of life was complete. And so um, once that circle of life was complete, next slide, um, you know, we find that we are, we are all connected and that we are all related no matter where we come from. No matter what color of our skin is, you know, uh, red, yellow, black, or white, or blue, or green, that we are all connected in that way, and that there was an understanding. Um, oftentimes, when I travel and I listen to the beautiful prayers that are out there, um, you know, I hear this commonality amongst our prayers. No matter what tribe it is, there's an acknowledgement to all my relations. So the so the prayer begins with all my relations. And then we close it with all my relations. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for, for uh, acknowledging all my relations. Uh, it is because we are related in that way. If you can forward the slide. Uh, go ahead and forward it until the, the four directions appear. <clears throat> oh, back up. I'm sorry. You can back up. Yeah. So um, so no matter where we come from, red, yellow, black or white, that we are all connected. And um, and this was what I'm what I'm talking about is uh, pre-colonization. So this was before uh, our world changed uh, as we once knew it. Um, we were connected. And if you pay attention to the original structure of the medicine wheel uh, and the way I'm presenting it, um, if you pay attention to the structure of it. Uh, later on, something happened that changed that. And uh, we believe that to be the boarding schools. When the boarding schools were established, it shifted uh, in the way we live. Um, my grandmother went to boarding school in 1940 to 1945. And I went to the, to the boarding school that she went to as a young girl. And I seen her name in the, uh, in the original roster for the year she went. And it had her name, uh, where she where she was where she was from, Ukiah, California, and uh, and when I saw her name in that in that roster of many other students, other kids, um, you know, it just hit me all at once, and um, and it was healing at the same time, but also very very sad to think about, you know, that my grandmother as a young girl was taken from her home and placed in a in this facility. Uh, and she didn't know anybody, uh, didn't know anyone there and, um, and was forced to, to assimilate. And so at the same time, my, my grandfather, Benjamin Campbell, uh, served in World War II. Um, most of his brothers served in World War II. And at the same time, 1940 to 1945, was experiencing his own trauma. Uh, came home from war with PTSD and alcoholism. And so together, um, they had a family. And, um, and so the trauma begins or the trauma continues. Um, so I grew up in a home that was assimilated. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't do anything cultural. 
Um, we didn't uh, pray. We didn't, you know, not, we didn't have spirituality in our home um, in the way that I do today. Um, but I didn't know any different. You know, I didn't know any different. I thought this was life. I thought this was the life that was, uh, was given to me and I had to accept it. And so, um, so the, so as a young boy, um, you know, being traumatized, uh, you know, by the adults in my family, um, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, incarceration was a normal way of life in my family. Um, you know, growing up, I thought that uh, I was going to end up dead or go to prison at prison at a young age, and that was going to be my life. I didn't know any different. You know, my grandmother, she gave me love. She gave me, um, you know, this comfort. Uh, and the only person in my life that did that at that time was my grandmother. And um, but my grandma was also very angry. My grandmother was angry at the world and um, and she expressed it. You know, any any um, opportunity she could to let the world know that she was angry. Uh, and so I remember one teaching that my grandma, um, you know, that she taught me as a, as a young boy was to separate myself from others. You know, she taught me to separate um, to, you know, you stay here and they stay over there. Um, you know, you're from here. They're from over there. And so I began to think that way. Um, I call it separation thinking. And, um, and, and I did that. I, I did that for uh, most of my life. Um, and so not only did the, did the government's policies separate us as people, but we also began to think that way as well. And so, you know, growing up being, being half homo Indian, um, and then also, um, my dad from Mexico. So I'm, you know, Mexican descent, um, but not from Mexico. And so growing up, not being, not being Mexican enough or not being Indian in enough was a, a struggle for me. And so the trauma continues, um, you know, trying to fit into a world that didn't accept me. And all of this stems from the historical trauma, you know, uh, the boarding schools, the, the reservation system, you know, all of which, you know, my grandmother never healed from. And so, you know, that was passed down to me also. Um, and so I think about, you know, the original um, structure, um, the original structure of the medicine wheel. And we believe that that shifted. And so if you could forward the slide, it continue. You know, we went from that structure of the medicine wheel to this. And you'll see the shift. Keep going. Here we go. So it shifted a little bit. And, and when that happened, it threw our family system out of balance. It threw our system out of balance. And it's like we've been lost ever since, you know, trying to find, um, trying to find our, our, you know, our footing again and trying to find you know, where we belong. Um, and so we believe that, you know, that was the, not only the boarding school, but the, uh, the, you know, the historical trauma that happened. And so this, when the medicine will shift it, um, you know, the alcoholism, alcoholism was introduced to us um, during a time of pain. Um, you know, our relationship with alcohol and drug addiction is not that long ago, you know, uh, we're talking about last couple hundred years, maybe a little bit longer than that. And, and so, and it was introduced to us during a time of, of emotional pain, depression, anxiety, fear, panic. And, and so it became an answer. It became an answer for my mom. It became an answer for my dad to, uh, you know, to, to find something that made them feel a little bit better than they felt. And it became an answer for me as well to find something that made me feel better than I, than I was feeling, which was deep, deep sadness and deep hurt. And so, you know, that's also a symptom of the deeper problem, which is the intergenerational historical trauma that the boarding school has left our people. Um, so it, you know, if you take, take a look at the symbol that you see now in the center of the medicine wheel. So if you could forward the slide, <clears throat> there's a symbol that came out of, you know, all of this trauma. And um, this symbol was standing at the boarding schools. It was standing 
during the massacres, during the reservation system. Now, if you look at the circle, the circle is lo no longer connected. Um, it's separated. And, um, and again, not only physically, but emotionally and mentally, we have separated from each other um, as, as human beings. You know, I like to refer to myself as a human being, you know, and, and you'll learn some things about me, um, about my cultural heritage. You'll learn some things about where I'm from. But before all that, I want you to get to know me as a human being first, as a human relative, having this human experience. You can forward the slide. So these are, these are um, other symptoms that we are currently working with in our communities. Um, you know, again, domestic violence, um, suicide amongst, amongst, our, amongst our adults and youth, incarceration, lateral violence. You know, we are hurting each other now more than anyone else. Um, overdose, family separation. You know, I grew up I grew up in a, in, a, in a family that was separated from the time I was a little boy. Me and my siblings were separated from our parents. Um, depression and anxiety, uh, mental illness. Um, you know, we lose somebody due to murder and death. Now we have to live on as survivors now, trying to, trying to cope with, with these emotions. Uh, we have a lot of families that are involved in child protective services. Um, sex and drug trafficking. Um, we're locking kids up today. Now, these are all symptoms of a deeper problem, which again, stem back to the boarding school. And so our work that we're doing now is, uh, you know, we are implementing programs to, to help our relatives to find the healing, uh, to find healing um, for our own traumas. You know, I had to really take a look at my childhood trauma and choose to heal, to choose to heal from this trauma. And it's not, uh, and it's, it's not something that happens overnight or over even a year. This has taken me 19 years, 19 years to, to get to where I'm at today. And today I know I have a choice that I can live in peace and not in pieces because my heart was broken. First woman that broke my heart was my mom. <laughs> You know, I laugh, I laugh a little bit about it because, um, you know, it's, it's also real to me, you know, um, and I, but I've also healed. I've also healed from that broken heart. Um, my mind was broken, broken into pieces. Uh, I didn't know that since I was a little boy that I had been living with undiagnosed depression and anxiety. And most of my adult life, I was living with this undiagnosed depression and anxiety. Um, you know, and I had to realize that, you know what, the things that we go through in our journey, um, of course, we're going to be impacted by it. Of course, you know, it's going to impact our mind and our heart and, and our physical and our spiritual. And so um, so what we want to do is provide the opportunity to, to opportunity to to heal from this. And it takes a journey. Next slide, please. Um, also, one of the policies that was put in place, uh, if you can forward uh, until all the words appear on the screen. Uh, also, one of the policies that was put in place when the when the boarding schools were done, um, the massacres, it was the relocation act. And so a lot of our um, a lot of our great grandparents and great great grandparents were taken from um, their homelands and they were placed in cities across Turtle Island. Um, such as uh, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, um, Seattle, um, uh, Minneapolis, Chicago, Phoenix, you know, you name it, you look at all the major cities in, in the U.S. and our relatives were dropped off in these places to go assimilate with the rest of the world, um, to go and work, to go and learn English and to, to be a part of that world. And so today, we have probably more Native American people living in, in the cities, in the urban areas, than we probably do on reservation lands. Uh, and with that, there's a separate issue. There's a, a whole set of issues that we deal with growing up in a, in a concrete jungle like a city. 
um, that you might not find so much on a rural area. Um, and so, you know, growing up, uh, I was impacted by this. You know, I was impacted by uh, growing up in a in an urban area where there was many people around, not just native or one, but there was many, many people from different cultures. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, part of that for, for me, you know, growing up, it, it was um, gang violence was a, was a huge part of growing up um, prison gangs and then trickling down into the streets. And so, you know, having to work and heal through that as well. Uh, next slide. So for, for the longest time, um, you know, I would talk about hurt people, hurt people. And this is true. We know that. I know that today that, you know, the people that hurt me, um, they probably were hurt when they were little. But I also know this to be true, that heal people can help heal other people. Not only can we experience vicarious trauma, but we can also experience vicarious healing. And uh, those of us who have gone through healing, um, working on the, the mental, the emotional, the physical, and the spiritual, we can also give healing away by simply healing ourselves. And so I also know that when I heal, I help to heal my ancestors that never healed, my mom, my grandma, um, you know, and, and beyond that. Uh, I know that when I heal, they also heal. And so this is the work that I'm dedicated to today. Um, I'm um, inspired, you know, by many people to continue the work that I'm doing. Next slide, please. So here are some of the, the programs that we have to offer. Um, circle peacemaking. Um, you know, really the foundation of healing is the circle. Um, I have done more healing in a talking circle than anywhere else. Um, more than a one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, more than, you know, than anywhere else, it, it's in the circle. Um, you know, we talk about intergenerational healing. Uh, I don't want to get stuck in the trauma. You know, I know what the trauma is. I know what the problems are. I want to talk about how can I heal now? You know, how do I heal from this? Uh, to be able to, to, uh, to face it. <clears throat> we understand that there's a physical world and there's an unseen world. Some call it heaven. Some call it spirit world, but that there's a world that's that's unseen, but it's very real. Uh, values, beliefs, and lifestyles. I call it sacred eight directions. Um, there's not only four, but there's eight. And we talk about the, the eight directions. Four directions of wellness. There's power in our story. Um, today, I know that um, when I share my story to others, whether it's professionally or whether it's uh, at a grassroots level, that I, also, I continue to heal. You know, I continue to heal from my trauma and my hurt. Conflict resolution. I was taught as a young boy how to deal with conflict by fighting it, by flighting it, or by freezing from it. This was taught to me. This is how you deal with conflict. I was taught how to deal with conflict in a dysfunctional home. I didn't have a voice. Um, I was picked on. I was, uh, I was hurt. And so I had to deal with conflict. And the way I learned how to deal with conflict as a little boy was to run away. I would shut down emotionally and mentally. And, and I would run away. And then when I got old enough, I said, no one's going to hurt me anymore. And so I began to physically hurt other people if they tried to hurt me. But what I learned through this process of healing is that there's not the only way we can deal with conflict. And so I put conflict resolution in a medicine wheel. So to the east, we can fight it. To the south, we can flight it. To the west, we can freeze from it, which is becoming emotionally numb, which I've done that as well. You live in the trauma for so long, you become numb. And in the north, we put friend. In other words, forgiveness. We have the ability to forgive ourselves, to friend something that is causing us conflict. I had to shake hands with my anger. I had to shake hands with my trauma 
and say, thank you for the lesson that you've taught me, but you're no longer going to control me anymore. And today, today I live in peace. Um, now, I know that's not easy to do. It took me years to get to that place. But I know that if I'm dealing with conflict and I'm always fighting it or I'm always running from it, I'm never going to find peace. So I had to choose to, to forgive myself for things I did, things I did do or things I didn't do. And, um, and so it's each one has it's your own choice to make, you know, how do we want to walk through this? Cause I tell you, it's easy to stay between fighting and flighting. I want to avoid it. I don't want to think about it. I want to stay away from it. But I also know that if I, if I choose not to deal with it, 20 years down the road, it's going to surface again. And I'll be, I'll be left to deal with it at some point. <clears throat> self-care in the medicine wheel. The Western world teaches us about self-care. And um, they teach us about self-care. Self-care, you know, uh, practice self-care. And, uh, and I remember during the, during the isolation period of the pandemic, I was isolated with everyone else. And, and um, there was a time where I realized self-care wasn't working. And so I really processed through that. And I thought about my ancestors. How would they have dealt with this? You know, how would they have dealt with, um, you know, working on physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual? And so our ancestors never thought about themselves. You know, it was always about the collective. And so I put self-care in the medicine wheel. To the east direction, um, we put self-care. You know, those are the things that we do maybe on a weekly basis, you know, taking a nap, going for a walk, reading, taking a hot bath, um, talking to somebody, you know, um, those are self-care. And, and in the south direction, I put we care. You know, our ancestors always thought about you know, the community. It was never about myself. And so we practice, we care. Supporting each other through this healing, through trauma is vital. I cannot do this alone. I need you all. I need the circle to help me, support me. Let me know that I'm not alone and that others can relate to me that have experienced what I've experienced. And then in the West direction, we put, community care. Now we're all in the work of community care. You know, I, I, I want to help our communities. But if I'm not well myself, how can I truly help my community? So I have to practice we care and self care before I can do community care. Because if not, I'm hurting myself or, or I'm hurting the community even more. And so, um, so we want to practice we care and, and self care. And when we're doing all three of these things in the unseen world, something is going to be activated. And I put that in the north direction. We call that community activated medicine. You can't see it, but it's happening. You'll start to see collaboration. You'll start to see healing. You'll begin to see, uh, you know, uh, unity, uh, working together, you know, on a common goal. Uh, you'll see families reunited. Um, you'll see sobriety, healing from addiction. When we're practicing self-care, we care, community care, we're going to activate that medicine in the unseen world. Next slide, please. Here is, a, here is a visual of a healthy human being. Um, you're going to have that sense of safety. You find your purpose in life. You're going to feel like you belong because you do belong. You're going to have healthy relationships. Um, you know, recovery is possible. Women are leading and our men are supporting that. There's a sense of freedom and identity. Today, I know who I am. Today, I honor all parts of me. All parts of me. My, my Pomo relatives, my Mexican relatives. And everything else that makes me who I am today. Next slide, please. Uh, you could you could go through this one here. Um, you can actually you could actually move move through this to the next slide. 
uh, keep going all the way until you see the complete circle. And I want to wrap up with uh, I want to wrap up with uh, the medicine wheel again right here. So. Um, so this again, this is one of the approaches that we're using. Um, it's not the only one, um, but it's another option. And so you see the, the bottom, um, the bottom pyramid is the Western approach. Um, the red pyramid is the indigenous approach. And the two on the side, those quadrants are for you. So we created a template that can be used no matter where you come from on Mother Earth. You will fill in those quadrants with your language, your songs, your traditions, your ceremonies, and make it fit for you and bring it all together as a way to heal um, from current trauma, childhood trauma, and historical trauma. Yeah, I want to thank you relatives for, for uh, taking some time out of your busy day to, you know, to, uh, to, to hear some of the things that we're doing in Santa Barbara, hear some of the things we're doing in, uh, you know, Indian country from Canada down to South America. Um, I hope you all, uh, you know, was able to take something from, you know, my, maybe my slides, maybe my story, maybe the approaches that you're able to take something and, and utilize it in the, your own work that you're doing to help heal from trauma and historical trauma. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeremy and Alexandra and Mr. Rivera for sharing your work and uh, Mr. Rivera for sharing so much of yourself and your story with us here today. Um, we have a few minutes to take a question or two. So if anybody has a question, um, you can place it into um, the chat. I'm seeing a lot of uh, thank yous, so that, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, or no if you questions. have a question, you could come off mute as well. Yeah, no questions yet, but uh, no, I appreciate each of you for being here, really do. Great. Awesome. Um, and Sean, will you um, go through to the slides? I'll share a little bit about our next events that are coming up and also our evaluation um, that we would love people to complete. And our slides and the recording will be available on our um, website um, in a short time. And so um, we also email that out to all registrants as well. And then to get the rest of the slides, you have to come to yeah. one of our trainings. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and here's a link for our evaluation. Um, we're always looking on ways to improve our programming. So please take a minute. Um, you can either take out your phones and take a picture of the QR code, or you can plug this into, um, into your web browser. And just sharing out a few events that are coming up. Um, on April 12th, we have um, a webinar, Growing Stronger Together, creating um, inclusive uh, healthcare services. Um, next week, also on April 13th, we will have a webinar on Indigenous wellness, helping our veterans heal. Um, we continue with our peer-to-peer -peer solutions center with um, HIT technical assistance um, on the 18th and the 20th, and another webinar on the 19th, um, growing our workforce opportunities and challenges. Um, all of our events can be found on our website as well. And if you haven't saved the date already, please save the date for our NICUI 2023 annual conference, um, which will take place um, in Washington, D.C. this year. Um, there's also a hybrid component. So visit our website um, to please register. And um, next slide, please. And that will wrap up our session today. Thank you so much to all of our uh, audience for attending and to our terrific speakers who shared so much of themselves today. Thank you.